Hi folks, let's walk through making this lathe chuck spacer and let's do three things. Let's show some of the tips and tricks that we learned on the Fusion 360 cam side of things. Let's show why this is a really helpful tool in general, whether you're on a manual lathe or a CNC lathe. And then let's talk about the design intent that make this tool really fun to use. Welcome to another Wednesday widget. So why make a lathe chuck spacer now? Well, number one, it is a really good beginner's machinist project, but it's actually been a really useful tool. We've had a number of parts for Johnny Five where we've had to do multiple redundant operations. Sometimes it's just facing off the backside of a small batch of components. So a lathe chuck spacer really helps in two ways. Number one, it keeps that part square to the spindle, which is really important for the accuracy of the parts. And number two, it maintains your parts height or location off of the chuck jaws, which means you can actually be really efficient even if you're using a manual lathe. And no folks, this is not April 1st. I am enthusiastically talking about a lathe project. So we've got a piece of aluminum in between a set of mod vices. We've had some questions as to why we touch off all four sides with our Heimer. And the reason we do that is I've often preferred to have our coordinate system at the center of our part. Now this is not the most efficient location. With a Heimer, you would technically be more efficient putting it in somewhere, say like the back left corner. And then you only have to pick up two edges instead of four. But what we have traditionally done is picked up the left side and then the right side of our stock. And then in Pathpilot, we divide that dimension by two and that puts us dead square in the center. All that this does is it splits any inaccuracy between our physical stock size and what we've got modeled in Fusion, in this case, the 5.25 inch width, it splits any difference evenly. So we're either cutting equal amounts of air, or if it's a little bit heavy, we're cutting a little bit more than we'd like, but evenly on each side. Now we're doing the roughing with the shear hog and God bless them, they're pretty tolerant of having too much width of cut, say you accidentally mismeasure your stock. But end mills are much less forgiving, especially when you're using adaptive style cutting. If we had programmed to have say 20% of the tool's diameter as our width of cut, and we've got a little bit of extra saw cut material on either side, and that stepped up to 30 or 40%, it's pretty quick to load up the food to that tool and either have to stop and clean it out or break the tool. A quick face with the Superfly, one good trick, edit that facing operation, under the last tab, linking, check extend before retract. So with its extend before retract, you can see the tool goes all the way off our part before it lifts up. If we turn that off, it lifts up as soon as the tool has reached past the center line of the tool. And a lot of times you can see a slight witness mark where that happens. If you want to set extend before retract to be the default option, you can't do it from here, but there is a way. Right click on the facing option and choose compare and edit search for extend. We see the extend before retract parameter. It is set to yes because I just checked it. Right click on that and choose make default. Spotting those holes, another really cool feature in Fusion, go to the heights tab and your bottom height, choose from to chamfer width and then we can type in, in this case, a 20 thou chamfer, and that will drive the tool deep enough to create a 20 thou chamfer around that part without having to model it. Very handy. If you use this feature, double check that you have the correct tip angle in the tool library for that tool. Otherwise, like most things in the world of CNC machining, the part will be wrong because the operator gave it bad information. Next up, some number seven drills for our pre-tap diameter. Drilling these at 150 surface feet, 5 thou feet per rev, pecking every 50 thou with a partial retract. Next up, the shear hog. Again, we just haven't found a tool that has matched the combination of material removal, long-term quote-unquote operating cost, and its tolerance for being run pretty hard. I do really like the corn cob roughers like the Lakeshore Taz, but those tools are expensive and there's always a risk of breaking them or chipping a flute. So the shear hog just remains a great tool for us here. 5,100 RPMs, just under 9 thousandths of an inch feed per tooth. 0.2 inch optimal load, 0.2 inch step down. And if you download our feeds and speeds worksheet off the NYC CNC website, we can show that 45 inches a minute at 0.2 depth of cut, 0.2 width of cut is just under two cubic inches a minute and about half a horsepower. So 
frankly still a conservative cut, but one that we're happy to run. Although card here to the video where we did push the shear hog to the max and uh, had about three times higher material removal rate. A cleanup pass with a quarter inch end mill. Here, the heights really matter. So if we rewind and go back to the shear hog recipe, under the heights tab, we set the bottom height as the selected contour, which is this bottom edge made of 20 thou. So we can see that that toolpath goes beyond the bottom of our part. On the 2D contour, we also run it below the bottom height, in this case, 10 thou. So what that does is it confirms that we've machined all the way down this and even a hair past it, but it doesn't touch the floor of the tool. And years ago, I found some Boeing presentation uh, on machining tips and strategies that is what led me to adopt this, which is a tool does a better job when it's either cutting on the floor or the sidewall. Don't ask it to do both because that influences and changes the tool pressure. The other reason that's important on a finishing strategy to run it below the bottom of your part, if you can, is that I love using tools that have a very slight tool tip radius. For example, this guy right here, it only has a three to five thou corner radius. So it's quite small. And for most of the work we do, that's not going to be an issue. And by getting rid of that sharp corner on the very tip of your tool, that's usually the first thing that breaks on an end mill. So you get better tool life, better surface finishes over the life of the tool, but it's important to run it deeper than the part to avoid having a radius. And finally, a quick deburr. Done with op one. Now the machinist in me would love to put this in a set of soft jaws to do the backside work, but it is a round part. So we can chuck it in the lathe. Just be careful because it will start out as an interrupted cut, but makes quick work of it and looks great. So some comments on the design and the design intent here. We're using three screws. We've got multiple holes that give us some flexibility in case we've got different interferences or features in our chuck jaw that require us to move the screws. We set the chuck spacer on a surface plate and use the height gauge to quickly set the height of those three screws, keeping them coplanar. Having magnets on the end of them makes it super handy to have it stay in your chuck and not have to fight it or grow a third hand. And you can still adjust each of the three screws to true this up if it needs further refinement uh, or your lathe chuck is slightly out relative to a surface plate, which absolutely could be the case. I've been looking for flathead screws that have a hex in the tip if those existed if those existed if those existed if those existed time out folks i found them shout out to my buddy ken uh, aka zodiac engineering over on instagram mcmaster car search for tip drive shoulder screws and these are shoulder bolts that have a hex for an allen key on both sides of the screw. So you can turn them from the head like you normally would, but also from the other side. Then what I would do is I would drill these holes all the way through. That would give us the ability to use a hex key instead of our fingers to give us a fine adjustment on each of the three screws before and to hold that screw in place when you lock the jam nut. And finally, we laser cut some acrylic pieces that are the exact same profile. And those are really handy for two different reasons. One, if you wanna put a part deeper into your chuck, but you don't want it resting up against the chuck, you can put these directly in the chuck without the spacer that we just made. Or if you have the spacer in there, but you want to space the part off of that further, you can use these in the nominal dimensions of the acrylic. So one eighth of an inch or even one quarter of an inch. Last comment I'll make is do be careful. I joke a lot about not liking lays. I, I do like lays, but lays can be really dangerous. And so you've got to be careful. You're sufficiently holding on to the part. If you have a chuck, make sure you stay within the maximum RPMs that chuck was designed for. Chucks can be different qualities, different countries of manufacture. They can be cast iron, they can be steel. The jaws can be smooth or they can be serrated. All these things massively influence how tightly it's gripping onto your part. And if you recall our videos that we've done with Paul Diebel, he is a very skilled machinist and he's able to hold onto some really large parts with only a very small amount of meat but he knows what he's doing. He's staying well within the RPM parameters and he's being conscious of the cutting forces that he's putting into that part as he's turning it in the lathe. So hope you learned something folks. Hope you enjoyed. Take care. See you soon.